Hey, everybody. So uh, we're a couple minutes late because we're having technical issues, but I didn't want to keep you guys waiting. So welcome to our weekly podcast where we discuss all things game audio. As you hear every week from creative ideas to the latest techniques, project experiences to audio secrets, here is where you'll find in-depth coverage and opinions related to game audio. And now to the technical issue. As a lot of you guys out there are probably realizing watching the live show, our chat room is not working. We've been sent this thing from our chat supplier to do a flash install of some crazy IRC something or other, and uh, I can't get it to work. So we found an alternative. If you go to HTTPS uh, colon slash slash webchat.freenode.net, what will happen is you'll be taken to a window where it asks you to put in your username, so just use your same username you use for the chat client already. It wants to know where the server is. Just type in Game Audio Hour and hit enter. Don't authenticate because it's going to ask you for a username and a password and it's going to have you do this CAPTCHA, which I always seem to fail no matter what. So uh, go to, again, HTTPS, webchat.freenode.net and put in your name that you typically use in the chat room and put in Game Audio Hour as the server and you'll see Alex, me, and Vince out there so far. And with that, I'm going to go to Vince and say, Hey, Vince, what's going on? Uh, sorry, I just had to mute him there because his keyboard was, was rumbling. He's going to have to unmute himself. <laughs> his okay. keyboard was... Can you, can you unmute yourself? There we go. Hi sorry. there. Your keyboard was rumbling. Yeah. Um, yeah, since I like typing on a second computer... It's, yeah, no problem. Don't worry about it, man. Yeah, but uh, hi. Sorry about all the rumbling there. Good to be on. I didn't hear it uh, because you were muted, I think. I didn't even notice it. But uh, thank you to Alex for saving our bacon with this chat uh, that we're popping into. Mike's in there now, too. Um, so hi, Alex in Japan. And by the way, I can't see you live. I can only see a picture of you touching a keyboard. That is indeed me. That is... Indeed, me. That's actually Jeff Bridges playing none other than a Yamaha CS80, which I so think Jeff you guys, Bridges, yeah, you Go guys ahead. will have to concede this is the most incredible picture of the entire year, right here. I bet you know what? I bet he's playing Wendy Carlos's original Tron theme. I bet that's what, what he's doing. <laughs> well, little known fact: Jeff Bridges actually wrote the uh, the theme to uh, or the soundtrack to Blade Runner on that same machine. Yes, that's right, and I think. Um, Somebody was uh, so I put this on Twitter and somebody was um, somebody was uh, complaining that it's fake and that it's Photoshop. But who cares? I mean, the fact <laughs> that somebody would actually go and Photoshop Bresh Jeff Bridges into a shot of somebody playing a Yamaha CS80 is incredible. Well, this this is a beautiful segue because Jeff Bridges just the other day threw out uh, the opening pitch at a game and instead of throwing it, he bowled it as the <laughs> dude would do, and uh, that was down in L.A where Mike Shapiro happens to be. Hey, Mike. How's it going? You know, that may qualify as the least elegant segue that has ever appeared on this show. So I think some congratulations are in order. I am doing very well. The weather here, as always, is amazing. So whatever's going on, you just walk outside, and you're just overcome with goodwill. Great to be back, as always. Hey, the guys are hearing it. I see Jack is in the chat room. Hi, Jack. Chase is in there. We've got Raphael in there. We're doing great. Everybody's found their way into the chat room, which I will be squinting. Actually, I'll just put on my glasses. It's like a superpower I have now all of a sudden. No, now we recognize you. Good morning, yeah. Kyle. Before, I looked like Superman. Now I don't. <laughs> uh, well done for me. So uh, I will uh, I will testify that the weather here is unbelievably awesome. Yesterday it was kind of dewy. It was a wet day, um, and uh, so today uh, we have some friends in from Canada, and I started up the grill about two hours ago and can't seem to get a hot enough fire to cook anything because all the wet wood I keep throwing on there. But they're out there taking care of it, so through the window you may occasionally hear the celebrations of, of cooked meat, uh, corn on the cob, and the lack of me being there, which is always a celebration. <laughs> so, okay. The Minhorn, as Alex says, is in line. So, today's topics, we've got the technical issues out of the way, we've got the introductions, and that horrible spiel that I have to say every time just to torture people's ears, all done. Those are off my list. Check, check, check. 
Our topics today are two things, and I have to preface this first one by saying one of the chatties, one of our favorite people, Chess uh, Bethia. Sorry about that. I said Chess Bethia. And I hope I'm saying your last name right. I didn't ask you when I met you how to say your last name. Bethia is what I think it is. And by the way, Chase, put your website into the chat uh, so I can tell everybody. Chase sent us a demo. He said, hey, guys, I got this thing. Uh, I've used it on a game, but I wanted to just see what you guys, what your opinions were on it. We've been talking about doing this topic for quite a while where we would uh, do kind of a, I hate to use the term, demo derby. And this one, if Sean Beeson is watching, came upon us suddenly. Because the reason I say Sean Beeson is because I've been in talks with Sean to participate on a show where we would review some demos. And if it was something you guys were totally into, we were thinking about doing, giving you a little behind the scenes, a spin-off show of Game Audio Hour demos. Um, and Sean Beeson would be hosting that because he's somebody I greatly respect. He's got a fantastic ear, and and I think he'd be into it. And uh, he 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 showed some rumblings, but I'll leave that up to him to confirm. So uh, I was just looking at the chat to see if Chase had put his website up there. There it is, ChaseBethea.com. C H A S E B E T H E A dot com. And uh, so Chase had sent us his demo and said, "Would you guys like to check it out?" Well, we've been thinking about doing this show. And what better time to start than with somebody else's demo? But uh, I only speak for myself, and I'm sure the guys agree, but I'll let them speak on their own uh, accord, that I get kind of nervous when I do demos because I'm somebody who totally believes that you should believe in what you're doing, push forward, uh, look to your examples for influence, and uh, you know, uh, listen to something while you're mixing something so that you can make sure you're hitting your marks. Uh, because sometimes reviews can be opinionated and one-sided and not necessarily, in my opinion, uh, true to the spirit of the music. And also, music is so subjective. So I fear doing uh, reviews of demos, to tell you the truth, because I think, who am I? Why do you want to know what I think of your stuff? Keep going. Do it. you got it. You've got the talent. You're here. Keep pushing forward. But um, with that said, a lot of people really like reviews of their stuff, and they want people to, you know give opinions, if not from a professional opinion, but from a different perspective, like maybe, and I do that, I do do this, well, I'll put out something that I think kind of falls into a classical realm, but I don't, I'm not a fantastic classical writer, so I'll, I'll look to people like Mike Shapiro and say, what do you think of this, or I'll look to people like, well, the guys on the panel, you know, some techno stuff that I want to send off to Alex, and of course, Vince has got an amazing talent, and my friend Mike, who, you know, studied the Royal Academy, I, I go, what do you think of this, and he'll, you know, go, well, it's great in this part, it's okay in that part, you need a lot of work in here, and here's how you do it, and those are very useful, uh, useful pieces of knowledge to have, so as I say, why do you want to know what I got to say about your stuff, at the same time, I can understand why people want to hear the opinions of other people, um, so, I'm going to go straight to Alex because it's the hot seat and he's great at handling that and say, Alex, let's talk about Chase's demo and uh, since this is something you do a lot of, I'd love to hear uh, also what your impressions were. Cheers. Okay. Well, first, I um, uh, just want to uh, repeat what you said. Big thanks to Chase for uh, offering up his demo. Uh, as you said, Carl, as well, you know, often when you're reviewing other people's work, especially, I mean, we're all, we're all doing, we're on the same industry and we're all playing the same game, metaphorically. And uh, there's sort of a bit of a sense of like, well, you know, what? How am I qualified to comment on this? However, um, Chase has has done us the gracious deed of uh, offering his demo up for some feedback. So uh, um, I've taken some notes. Uh, firstly, I I love the um, it's a it's a nice kind of uh, I don't know if you remember the game Wipeout, um, sort of like a nice '90s techno kind of feel that he's got going here. Um, uh, and I enjoy enjoy that a lot. And it's very the the music itself, as a whole package, is very evocative. Um, it ev it evokes certainly feelings of that kind of '90s techno, fast moving um, uh, sort of early techno kind of feel, which I really like. Um, to summarize uh, feedback, I I think the main thing for me is the kick. This uh, this kind of music relies entirely on a, a rhythm as minimal as you can make it. Um, and so uh, the kick, in in uh, in this case, the kick is uh, it's the core, the center of the whole sound. Uh, in this particular case, Chase, I think that the uh, the kick could have been uh, a little bit uh, more click 
and more deep end and less sort of in the in the the high bass area. At the moment, there's a lot. It's sort of a kind of a a pulsy sound in the sort of the high bass. This one needs to go much deeper with more of a click on the top end, um, together with uh, some side chaining. I think. Um, uh, side chaining is pretty essential in this case. You've got quite a busy mix. There's a lot going on. Uh, if you're intentionally trying to get uh, this kind of dense, busy sound, then it's even more important that uh, the kick really pushes through. And uh, the easiest way to do that in this particular case, which is often used with this kind of music, is uh, to side chain various aspects of the mix so that when the kick comes through, everything else is ducking down so that the kick can pop right through. Um, another trick that you can use is uh, do some a side chain with multiband compressor, so that you actually are ducking out just the bass frequencies of of uh, parts that overlap to where the bass drum hits. So the bass parts or the lower pads just ducking out, maybe with like a a, um, um, a shifting high pass filter to to duck in and out as the bass drum hits. So this is like trying to uh, trying to trying to trying to do this. Um, so as as the bass come, the bass drum hits the whole lower frequencies get shifted up. So look at that. That looks cool, doesn't it? <laughs> I think we're going to have to go with rated PG for this video. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, that that would be the um, uh, the main advice that I could give. I think is just uh, rethink the kick, go a little deeper, add more click to it, um, uh, side chain everything to really let the kick pull through. And uh, maybe pare down the percussion, like the, the hi-hats and some of the background loops a little bit. Um, uh, just to sort of, yeah, as I said, this kind of music relies on, on as minimal percussion as you can make it. Uh, the early techno was kind of characterized by what Chase has achieved with this, um, with this demo track, in that this, they often overlaid these loops behind, behind what is essentially a sort of a four-on-the-floor basic kind of um, uh, techno line, they'll put these loops behind it to kind of fill it out a bit more. Um, uh, however, because we've already got that density with the rest of the pads and these uh, the other synth parts in the top of the mix, that density is there, which means that the percussion really can take the opposite role. Instead of trying to fill out the mix with extra texture, the percussion can be scaled right back so that essentially all you need is a really powerful kick and maybe even just like one hi-hat on the offbeat. Um, and I think if, if you did that, uh, it would probably kind of drive the track a lot more uh, effectively, really pushing the rhythm on and hopefully allowing you more sort of oral space to enjoy some of those uh, interesting pads and stuff that you've got in on the top. So, uh, uh, yeah, that would be my advice. So uh, let's just go down the line. Do you mind uh, if I go to Mike next for his uh, impressions as well? Sure, Mike. Uh, certainly. Uh, I can't offer as sophisticated a critique or commentary as Alex did because he's a specialist uh, in EDM and I don't even know if EDM is the right term anymore. So I'm coming at it from a much more from the hip uh, perspective than these guys. But uh, here are a couple of thoughts. Um, big picture. What I really like about the piece, what I think is its strength, is the rhythmic interplay between the central drum loop, or loops, might have been too superimposed at some point, and uh, what I'll call the bass line, even though it was kind of more mid-rangey, so it's like the mid-range line. When those two interlock with each other, they complement each other very nice rhythmically, and I think that's kind of the, the defining premise of the whole cue. So <coughs> thumbs up on that. It works really well. Um, if I were to offer one constructive criticism, uh, it would be as follows, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying it's very personal, so this is definitely not a right or wrong thing. It's not even a technical issue. It's strictly a matter of taste. I would like to hear a little more spectral variety across the queue as a whole. Right now, it's kind of lots of high-end all the time, and I find that a bit fatiguing. Um, this may be something that the genre calls for, and it may be that in the context of the game, you just need to punch through the explosions and whatever else is going on. And if that's the case, uh, I respect that. And don't listen to the old guy talk about electronic music. However, uh, if you found some opportunity to provide variety, not just in, in kind of instrumental texture, which you do provide, you have instruments coming in and out, and you have nice contrast periods and, and more restful periods, but 
maybe filtering some of the high end off or queuing it dynamically during the during the queue or just picking instruments that aren't so bright. Uh, it might give the ear a much needed respite. And I don't think you need a whole lot of this. A little bit will go a long way, at least as far as my own tastes go. There's a mellow pad you have at the beginning that kind of hangs out throughout most of the queue, and stuff in that ballpark, I think, would make a nice contrast. Uh, the busyness sometimes borders on too busy for me personally. Uh, I marked a few spots where that was the case. I think it was before the break at three minutes in. Uh, it got so busy where you had kind of two busy synth groups, one on the left, one on the right, and then you've got this fairly busy drum line in the middle. Uh, my brain almost was overwhelmed by the counterpoint, which is something that happened to me a lot in college, and uh, <laughs> you might look for some way to thin out the texture there. Uh, I had a few comments about the kick drum, but they all sound moronic compared to Alex's uh, erudite essay on that subject, so I'll move to my last comment. Uh, <laughs> this is out of context, right? So this is probably part of a game, and you've got a certain level of energy and consistency you need for the game. But if I were to listen to this as a standalone track, I would want to hear a little more of a sense of dramatic arc. Um, the recap where you return to the main texture that you introduced at the beginning, and it feels like more of the same. Now, you may do that deliberately. Maybe you're looping this cue forever, in which case, that's right on. But for the album version, it would be cool if it got a little bigger towards the end and felt more like a recap. And one way you could do this would be have some sustained texture to, you know, like add a pedal, kind of, kind of like underlining a sentence, just give it a sense of weight, and that would be really cool to give it some energy at the end. You do have a pad going throughout, but it's very mellow, and that's suitable for the opening, but if you wanted to give it a sense of going up to the next level uh, in the musical rather than game sense. Some kind of gritty pad underscoring the whole tumult would be really, really cool. Awesome. And that is all I can come up with. So I will hand it over. I'll hand it back to... Well, I apologize for that distraction. A hand came up from the floor and refilled my wine glass. <laughs> <laughs> They had noticed that uh, it was empty, and that's so a, that's the, all right. Your servant, is it? They, they tried to stay. Service. They tried to stay secretive. I don't know if you noticed, but the door just came open, and then somebody came in on their hands and knees. A wine bottle came up, refilled <laughs> my glass, and then backed out. Uh, that seems to be becoming a habit of the show. I apologize for that. I never know uh, what's going on there, but I appreciate it, and and thank you to Brian Estabrooks for refilling my wine. Uh, so Vince. Oh my gosh, I was stuck on mic as I made that explanation for the people in the video. Sorry about that. I'm going to Vince now. Vince, what did you think of Chase's, uh, Chase's demo? So yeah, um, I thought it was pretty cool. I agree with uh, a lot of what Alex and Mike has said, uh, especially with the kick drum. Um, and I really liked the busyness. There was really only one moment when I thought those, uh, those various synth lines, and I actually really liked uh, some of the writing that was in there. I thought they really complemented each other pretty well. There was one moment right at about 2 minutes and 15 seconds in, and that was the moment where I thought, okay, now it is too busy. Um, and I really wanted some sort of reprieve there. Um, and uh, listening to it a second time, you know, I wonder if um, a little bit more work on the stereo imaging that you've got uh, for the song in terms of the placement and um, getting things to just fit in the right place and also moving it around over the course of the song, you know, getting your ears to listen to, you know, a particular position. I noticed that you were actually uh, doing some more interesting or extreme stereo panning actually in the quieter parts where you have a less thick arrangement. And I think you might actually want to reverse that, have something that's a little bit more extreme with your panning for specific instruments once it gets busier. If you want something to stand out, don't be afraid of putting something all the way in the right or all the way on the left. Um, and I think that could help with making um, you know, all the writing that you've got going on a lot more intelligible. Um, so... Um, yeah, um, yeah. I felt the same thing with uh, Alex and the kick drum. Uh, I think besides that, a character uh, that uh, where the kick drum is actually driving the song, 
Uh, I did feel that there was a lacking low-end energy throughout, and I thought maybe if the kick drum wasn't the one driving it, it could have been something else. You know, maybe some big thumping low-end pulse synth of a sound there, um, creating some more drive. Uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be the kick drum, although I think for the type of song that you've got here, uh, yeah, it probably should be the kick drum. But I could see that uh, extra low-end energy and low-end drive coming from something else if you so choose. So, uh, yeah, I think that's it for me. Yeah, well, I'll, um, I'll give my opinion as well here. So, I really liked it. I really enjoyed it. I love that kind of music. And I'm not very good at writing it. But I've mixed a lot of it. And there's a couple of things that come to mind. Um, the pacing reminded me of being in a car, and I love that. But I've noticed that there's two different, uh, well, in my career of mixing stuff, I've noticed that in the 70s and 80s, the sound of that, that, that kind of music that elicited that feeling of being of driving a car was different than the 90s version and the 2000s version of driving a car. Um, in the in the 80s uh, and 90s kind of techno sound and even in rock and roll, the the consistency of driving a car was created by or the sound of driving a car was created by a consistent tonal kind of center that just kept a rhythm. You know that that whole four to the four to the floor, but the tonality of the of the track was somewhat monotone. It didn't have a lot of moving around. It really focused on a center. Uh, and when you listen to rock songs that remind you of being in a car, you'll notice that they have kind of a tonal center that that moves at this pace. But yet, in modern techno, the same feeling is given through side chaining and doing a lot of that with the kick drum. And so you've got that pumping, boom, 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 which really also gives me that same feeling of kind of driving a car at night, lights are flying by, and I love that feeling. And you definitely achieved... Uh, that feeling with this with this with this song it was well done. I also noticed that the bass end was a little light, and that often happens with people who are mixing down on subwoofers, and their subwoofer has a different volume than it should. Uh, if a subwoofer is too loud, obviously when you mix, uh, your subwoofer is going to be kicking back to you these frequencies louder than you think they should be, and so you start pulling them down. And then when it plays on somebody else's system that either doesn't have a subwoofer or they have a subwoofer that's balanced with their with their system, uh, the, the bass end kind of falls out. So if you've got the frequencies in the sub and the sub's too loud, you'll probably pull them back. I'm wondering if that may have been what caused you to have uh, the, the, the low end be just lacking a little bit. Um, I still thought, I still could hear it, and I still knew what you were doing down there but it wasn't as balanced with the mid and high range. Uh, so I, I threw it through a spectrum analyzer as well, and I looked at what was going on there, and, and it showed that the, sub, that the bass level was a little lighter than you would expect from a track, similarly. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, yeah, I got side chaining. Oh, um, so mixing for me, uh, just uh, esoterically assigned to my way of doing things is very similar to being a sculptor and having a giant piece of blank slate and you keep pulling things away until it looks like what it's supposed to look like. And sometimes you pull away too much and you have to plaster some stuff on there and you have to you know, blend it in to make sure that it goes back to the way it was. But the idea of me for mixing is that you would get from the, from the uh, artist or from whoever sent you these stems or these tracks a bunch of stuff. So you're recording, you record everything that you can possibly think of, and then you let the mixer say, well, we don't need that guitar track, and this is a little loud, or we could take out that percussion section altogether. And when doing, when I was listening to your song, I noticed there was one thing that I would have made the suggestion to actually uh, take it out rather than leave it in. It was necessary at the beginning, but once the song starts going, it, it, I didn't feel, as a mixer, I would have suggested that you uh, that you take it out. And that was the background pad that you had going. So the song itself had its own signature at that point. The, the pad was kind of, in, in my estimation, was an introduction to the song and, and definitely needed to have its moments where it came back up again. But once the thing was driving and it was really moving forward, the pad seemed like it was sitting in the back seat and just wouldn't stop talking. You, know, you ever had that person that sits in the back and you go, I know where I'm going. Stop telling me. But um, 
I thought it's it's definitely necessary and you want it there, but there are times when you want to take it out and then if you feel like it's a good time to bring it back in, bring it back in. Don't be afraid to do that. Um, so all in all, though, I looked at it from a context of being in a game, and games require music that has uh, a lot of the elements that you had in this. It had uh, a, a, a range that was specific uh, because it's got to play on all kinds of different speakers, and so you kind of stayed in that. So there's a lot of there's a lot of my ear that was listening to it from a pro audio aspect, and then I had to go well. You know, uh, this is also for a game, and those rules do not always <laughs> coincide. And so, uh, so some of the suggestions that I may have, have may have are based on pro audio, where you can completely ignore those because you specifically did that because the speakers can't handle the low end, so you don't want a heavy low end. You know, um, you know, you probably knew best what what your what your constraints were for this. For, I know you knew best what your constraints were for this song, and so uh, I apologize if I've stepped on your toes in that way, but. Um, yeah, I felt that it definitely achieved this feeling of motion. It definitely achieved this this time specific standard uh, that perhaps the game was designed for. Uh, it, 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 and and yet it still has has long teeth. You know, I mean, this is something that I can play five six years from now, and I predict will still sound relevant. So it well done on that, absolutely. Um, but it, it was leading me to one thing that I forgot about. and Oh, the groove was fantastic. I was just tapping my feet the whole time. There were memorable um, uh, melody kind of moments in there. Uh, throughout the whole thing, there were different uh, melodies that my ear kept grabbing, so I appreciated the counterpoint, and uh, it gave me something to listen to. Uh, it, was, it was the stereo spread. It definitely felt closed, but then again, if you're playing this on a Nintendo DS or something... Or even, you know, I don't know what you wrote it for, but maybe you were considering that mono speakers uh, may be involved, and so you, the stereo wasn't something that had to be focused on. This is, you know, it's great that you put this demo in here because it brings out so many... It really does highlight the differences between pro audio, which is actually easier to mix for, and game audio, which is much more difficult. Because pro audio... They're probably going to have stereo speakers. They're probably going to be playing it on headphones. How often do mono pro audio albums come out? They don't. So unless somebody's doing some Beatles flashback Beatles, thing, yeah. but, but but and when it comes to game audio, we have to consider that this is probably going to be played on a TV. It might be played on a five one system. More than likely, it's going to be played on a stereo system if it's a computer game. And we consider all those things when we do all these mixes. Uh, what do you guys think of that? Because that's all I had for suggestions and, and uh, evaluations, if you will. I hate saying it, of somebody's demo. Great job, Chase. And thank you so much for kind of uh, bearing the nakedness of, of your soul and saying, here's a song, please review it, and let me know what you think. Uh, congratulations. But with that, I'd like to also move on to what you guys think about... Uh, the difference between mixing and mastering for games as opposed to pro audio. Yeah, I know I'm looking forward to actually seeing how Bioshock holds up on an iPad. I don't know if you guys heard, but Bioshock is now there, courtesy of um, 2K China, I think. Um, oh, I didn't imported it to iOS, and apparently it's a very good conversion. Now that's you know some wonderful sound design, uh, Gary Scheiman's great soundtrack for that game. Yeah, beautiful. And, and you know, I, I'm just thinking about you know, you go down into the city for the first time and you see everything. It's a wonderful, not just visual moment, but also an audio moment there. And I'm really interested to see what they did on iOS. Um, I know with um, you know a lot of games. Well, not a lot of games, but some games actually take advantage of uh, Apple's ability to tell the game, hey, someone plugged in headphones, or now this person is connected to AirPlay. I wonder if you need to change the mix at any oh. point. So, uh, and we have multiple mixes? Would that be something we do in the future where we store specific uh, mixes for specific devices? Yeah, maybe, because yeah, there's so many ways that you can play it. You know, yeah. if you're in the privacy of your home, own home, but you don't want the discomfort of headphones because you have crappy headphones, but you still want to listen to the sound, but then you immediately go out and you need to catch a bus and you want to keep on playing your game and you put on your headphones. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it's it's tough. It's tougher now more than ever, especially with the proliferation of all these different handheld devices, the phone, the iPad, the, yeah, uh, the DS and Vita are still have got some real life in them. Um, and you know what? I'm working on a, uh, uh, an iOS game right now, and uh, I'm doing a lot of short sounds, and I'm wanting those to be stereo, 44 one at the very least 16-bit. I prefer 4824. And the guy who's running it very smartly said, I just want mono and I want it to be able to sound like the sound that you're creating. Because we need to save all of this space, you know? Maybe the one day the thing will end up on a pebble that has a speaker. And you got to consider that, you know, there's age to these games as well. And what are they going to be ported to? Of course, that's not fair when you're producing a game right now. It needs to sound like the platform that you're shooting for or the platforms you're shooting for right now. But um, but if somebody starts driving the quality down, that can be your argument is in the future that will be useful, but right now that's going to perhaps hinder the sales of the game. But I'm, I'm doing it. I'm doing it in mono. I'm doing it in 22050. And, yeah. it, and to tell you the truth, the sounds... I did a comparison, you know, on the device, on an iOS device, and I was like, well, I can't tell the difference between that sound on at 44.1 and that sound at 22.05. They really hold up. Yeah, that's kind of the uh, sort of the sad thing. Uh, maybe sad is not the right word, but uh, uh, one of the, the areas where us game audio people have got a lot of work to do, I guess, is um, elevating people's expectations for audio on mobile devices because at the end of the day, you're either listening to it on tiny little piezo speakers on the bottom of your iPhone, or you're listening to it like through through these uh, these marvelous marvelous uh, devices on, on a noisy train or in a subway or, or at least outside, or you know yeah. maybe your your family somebody in your family is watching TV while you're playing this game on the couch, and you know it, it's sort of a it's a, I guess it's an uphill battle that we have to fight to to show people that. Uh, um, that uh, music can be engaging and, and the gameplay can be enhanced because of the music. However, as you said, Kyle, I don't know whether the our best weapon is audio quality in this particular case. Um, if you have a compelling soundtrack which is somehow integrated well into the game uh, that elevates the gameplay, but it is 22.05 and, and that the quality is very low, uh, that's probably better than just a sort of an incidental soundtrack that just plays in the background at 4824. Mm. So mm. I don't know that our best weapon in this war, in this uphill war against the mute button, I don't know whether uh, our best uh, best weapon is audio quality in this particular case. It's more likely musical quality, I guess. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? That's a good thought. I mean, well, you know, you're not going to... The quality yeah. of, of the composition needs to be fantastic anyway, and... <laughs> Thank God for Vince and Mike and Alex for putting out fantastic quality stuff. Uh, because in the end, uh, how's it, what's that saying? You can shine a turd, but if you get done, it's still a shiny turd. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so it doesn't matter if the mix is in. You know, there's going to be circumstances. Let me reword that, where you're going to have to do a low, a low end, mono, low quality mix, and as long as the quality of the music is good, it's really where it is. And so that's good because I know we 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 we'll, we will evangelize how in game audio you need to be doing it this way, but it really does come back to just putting out a good product, and if the mix will hopefully uh, will show that it's still a good product. I think if you have the opportunity, I think it's always a great. Um, it's great to actually start your work with the with the intention of it being ultra high quality. However, you need to, as you go through it, you need to, of course, be assuming that when it comes right down to the end of the line, it may uh, be dropped right down for the purposes of implementing in the game. However, if like Chase, uh, like in this particular case, Chase mentioned that I think uh, this sound, this uh, track was in the game, but he's going to be aiming to put it on a, like a soundtrack yeah. of the game. Right. I mean, if you're lucky enough to have that opportunity and releasing your game as a soundtrack for people to purchase, um, uh, that's, of course, when you can really take advantage of, uh, of you know, excellent audio quality. Because hopefully the idea is that if somebody likes the music in your game so much that they're willing to buy a soundtrack of it and sit there and just listen to the music, that's when the best weapon can become audio quality again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. 
Ugh. Mike, you're awfully quiet. You got any thoughts in this area? Well, I remember when I started doing music for iOS games, having previously done PC stuff, and a little bit of console scoring, uh, and being kind of shocked when I was told, hey, uh, the footprint of our, uh -oh. of our application can't be bigger than X, so can, uh, am I freezing? I can't tell. Yeah, a little bit. Sorry about that. You can tell us because we're no all way. hanging on the edge of our seat going, what's he going to say? Yeah. Uh, if for some reason I get, if I drop out so much that you can't even slightly figure out what I'm trying to say, then be like in that scene in Team America, just wave your hands violently and I'll, I'll try to infer that our <laughs> bandwidth has gotten so bad that no one's understanding anything. But yeah. uh, I'll, I'll compress the content of what I'm going to say. Uh, so anyway, yeah, culture shock when I had to and I had to defend stereo as something we should strive for, and maybe suggest okay we can take it down to 128, uh, but you'll really care about stereo because often in mobile devices people are using headphones, and you know even though the fidelity is lower, we do experience that sense of space, and we may experience it more than if we're just holding the iPhone in our hand and listening to the speakers. So uh, that was crazy. Beyond that. Um, I think our best weapon in this war is the passage of time because storage media will get cheaper and more capacious and processors will get faster and we can dream of a day when we'll all have 48K, 24-bit uh, in our mobile devices and not care because there's just so much non-volatile RAM to go around. Mm -hmm. Hey, or Vince... You have to do this all the time because you have to make these decisions as an audio director. Uh, what do you think of Raphael's, uh, Raphael's comment uh, in the chat room about 192K? Well, man, Basically, I don't Raphael know if you guys can hear. Listen to the, the room that I'm in. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, I can have the best speakers connected to the best audio interface, um, and maybe it's even pumping out just some fantastic music. Um, like, uh, I don't know, the Philly Symphony Orchestra, and they're playing it in this room, and this room is not allowing me to take advantage of 24-192. Um, no, I, but uh, I've heard 24-192, and it's wonderful. It's absolutely fantastic. I would, uh, you know, a decade ago, I was actually looking forward to seeing more of DVD audio and super audio CDs take off because I thought they were yeah. really good. Um, and you can't really get too many of those now, except for you know boutique classical and jazz albums. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's it's one of those. It's a tough thing. Um, I really like going for the highest quality that I can get out of the product. You know, I've, I I really would love for my video game soundtrack to be 24 bit, to be uncompressed audio. Now, now, of course, there are diminishing returns with all of that stuff. You know, am I going to be getting 192 kilohertz of data if I'm using sample libraries that are recorded at 1644? Um, you know, probably not. Um, if you are recording a world-class soloist, the musician for your soundtrack, and they have such mastery that you can tell when they're off their game for a day at 24192 as opposed to uh, 2444. Well, actually, yeah, I do want to record that guy on a really good day at 24192, and I think someone can appreciate the difference there. Um, yeah. But it's it's a tough thing. It's a tough sell for uh, consumers these days. I tell you, I um, pro audio game audio. It's still a separation for me. I don't consider 192 to be necessary in game audio. And I've got a lot of people who are listening to this webcast right now going, Kyle, you're an idiot. But in the <laughs> end, it's going to get mixed down, you know. You need it to sound good at 1644, trust me, because that's probably what it's going to get shipped at. Um, there's, go ahead. Oh, you know, there's something about uh, uh, resolution. You know, the resolution that we sample things at, um, not just visually but also orally, and how it relates to the things that we either look at or interact with. You know, we like looking at things that are real and have infinite fidelity to them when we inspect them. But when we're playing with it, we don't 
play around with the details. We play around with the larger concept, the abstraction. So in terms of the visual resolution, we're okay with lower resolution. You know, for all those people back in the day that were wondering, why the heck do I not have 1080p out of my 1080p PlayStation 3 or Xbox 360 consoles? You know, there were 99% of the rest of the gaming populace were like, well, we're having fun playing around with what this thing is on screen. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, with audio, you know, we're we're dealing less with those details and more with the interacting with these abstractions of audio concepts that are communicated effectively. Um, and do you need 192 to do that? Well, I'm not sure. You know, just that example that I was saying about recording a really world-class musician, you're probably not going to be interacting with that person's ass, uh, with that's did I, I was about to say that person's assets, but that's not quite the right thing. With, with the recording that that world-class musician is making, um, you're going to be listening to it and wanting to appreciate it, but you're not going to be necessarily interacting with that. And so maybe you don't necessarily need that resolution if it's going to be, you know, interactive audio assets. Yeah, well, I was going to go on to say, and it falls right in line with that, pro audio, I do the opposite. Yeah. I want a 192. I've got a Fidelia, I think it's called. Jack was Jack Minhorn will correct me on this. It's a it's a player, uh, of, of, right. an Fidelia. audio player, audio and file oh sorry, what did you say? Oh yeah, that's right. Fidelia is from Audio File Engineering, isn't it? That's it. Yeah. yeah, Fidelia, and it will play high def albums. I buy more of my albums from HDTracks.com, www.HDTracks.com, than any other place, iTunes included. Because I run them through Fidelia on this beautiful system. I can actually pump it through AirPlay out to my system out in my front room and play it on a 7.1 surround. It's an amazing experience. Radiohead's King of Limbs in high def is unbelievable. And I highly recommend you get it. It's fantastic. Um, so does, is that an amazing experience to listen to? Absolutely. And I've now, luckily, I get to say, I have mixed two 192 albums, which I'm really happy about. And, but there's things that you find out about your system. Like, for instance, with 192, I'm using some Motu gear. I don't get access to all the tracks. They actually fold them down. So to get the higher definition, they use fewer channels. And I, I was like, oh, wait, I can't, uh, you know, my, as you can imagine, that caused problems with my mix when I had a bunch of stuff on different channels, and now I couldn't hear half of them because I was at 192, and I had to, oh, wait, i got to get a new piece of equipment. Okay, now I'm good. I can now hear everything in 192. Guys like John Rod, who I definitely want to have on the show. So if somebody knows John Rod, say, Kyle Johnson is coming for you. Um, <laughs> he does some amazing mixes, and his knowledge is just unbelievable. Um, I would like to hear his opinion on 192 as well. But in a pro audio situation, um, I love that. And yet, as a nostalgic guy, I have uh, right here to my to my side an Akai surround stereo reel-to-reel -reel tape player that I throw classical album or classical tapes through, reel-to-reels through all the time. And I love the sound of that too. You know, is high def better than classic just audio noise. Some people will argue that albums sound better and that they'll never be 192, you know? It's so funny. It's it's so fickle. I appreciate all of those sounds for what they are rather than saying we should target a specific sample rate and we should go for that and that's all we should focus on. Um, I don't know if that's the case. And in game audio, of course, the higher the, the definition, the bigger the file size, and don't we all know that as audio guys, getting real estate on a game for amazing audio is like pulling teeth out of a horse while he's running the Kentucky Derby. That's funny. You can laugh anytime you want. I'll wait. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted Some of there. us have tried that, pal. I was trying to... You never know when I'm going to give a good joke. I understand what took the time. That's okay. I think the um, it's the it's the intention that's that that defines these things. You know, I mean, if you're if you're doing high end pro audio for an audio file, of course, the the there's no you know the sky's the limit. If you are uh, if you know if you after that sense of nostalgia or that sense of um, deeper feeling emotion, then maybe 
vinyl will be best for you. You know, maybe that that old classic sound, yeah. uh, all that noise. It, it's not so much about noiseless operation or or um, uh, faithfulness to the original performance. In that particular case, the intention is different. It's about the vibe. It's about the nostalgia. It's about the mojo. You know, it's about the feeling. Mm -hmm. And in the case of game audio, um, uh, ascent, I mean. It, when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, we are making sounds and music for games, and that's kind of key to the intention of what we're doing. That it is, is it's for a game, so it's complementing what the player is doing with the game. So, yeah. as I said, you know, is um, in that particular case, yes, you could go up to whatever the system you max out what the system can do as far as your audio quality is concerned. However, I think um, I might argue that. Uh, um, uh, a weak, weak musical implementation in the game with superior audio quality is going to lose out to poor audio quality with an excellent implementation in the game. Yeah. Uh, by implementation, of course, I mean um, uh, just the way that it fits together with what the game's trying to do at any particular moment and how the player is feeling and how the developers want the player to feel. You know, the the audio quality in that particular case is not really not really so important, I and mean, you could even, uh, I mean, a lot of the, of course, the, this is a kind of a cliched argument, but you go back to all the classic retro consoles, and, you know, they've got uh, nothing in the way of sound quality. However, of course, all of us with gaming backgrounds can sort of go on for ages about how this game soundtrack made us feel, or, yeah. you know, the memories of playing that game and hearing this melody for the first time, or whatever. None of that's anything to do with audio quality. That's just good music, good in, yeah. and good kind of fit perfectly in with the, with the game. So it's all about intention. I think game audio, well, it's probably uh, the uh, implementation trumps audio quality in that particular case. You know, it's funny because uh, the, the Fat Man soundtrack to seven, uh, The Seventh Guest, seven, which I yeah. talked about before, is what really got me into doing games. Uh, it was because I could take his CD, 1644, and throw it in my car and go. But now I could do that on iPods. I could do that on all kinds of things. The car speakers aren't any better. I could throw my 192 high definition iPod of the Fat Man's latest amazing soundtrack, and I'm still going to listen out of car speakers that sound like car speakers. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's like it seems like a, a fruitless effort because technology is not necessarily keeping up with the space, but uh, the the audio quality. But I also, as you were talking, Alex, it made me think: Is this an argument? If you go to get, if you get a contract with a game company that is doing this amazing, uncanny valley, they're going to come the closest to ever defining the difference, but, uh, creating a a gray line between the difference of a real actor and a and a, and a CG actor. Do you argue, let me do 192 because your graphics are so advanced that you need to have a 192 soundtrack? <sighs> How do you guys feel about that? I would, say, I would say it depends on what you're going to do with the music and how it's going to complement what the visuals are doing. If, if, the, if, you have some, if you're just after pure realism, then maybe you could justify doing that. However, if you're going to be doing something more beyond pure realism in a musical sense, or at least in an emotional sense, because pure realism only goes so far as, as far as moving the player. Oh my god, it sounds like I'm really here, but I'm already seeing that anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're going to be just going for pure realism, great, but then if, if your intentions are somewhat uh, deeper as far as emotion and feeling and nostalgia and memory are concerned, then I would say that, you know, 48... 48 or maybe 44.116 is enough. That's what I would probably say. You know, I heard uh, Mike was with me. When we went to E3, we heard a, a set of headphones that had surround sound on them. So that was really amazing, and I would want to have high-quality audio pumped through those headphones because I knew that it was going to register. I know that it would register with me emotionally, and what they were playing was not necessarily registering me. So they had this fantastic technology that I feel that the audio quality wasn't keeping up with. But if we had the audio quality... Imagine a soundtrack coming out. And Mike, this goes to you. Imagine that you wanted, uh, you're conducting an orchestra. You've put this amazing uh, soundtrack together. You've been given the privilege of conducting the orchestra to record this. Uh, you, what you hear standing there is orders of magnitude better than what we're going to hear as far as sound quality 
coming out of the game. And so I imagine that you want to say, let's get the the tallest, the highest HD quality possible, so that I can parlay to the people listening the same experience that I have standing surrounded by all these musicians. And if you had headphones on that could do it, or if you had some speaker system at home that could uh, that could emulate it, would you be a proponent, or would you say, let's not get our audio files so big? Uh, it's a question we're asked of me today. I think I would rather earn the trust of the developers by not trying to oversell something that will essentially be uh, imperceptible. Uh, I'm not... I was actually having kind of a parallel discussion with Vince in the chat room. Uh, I'm not sure there are human beings who can differentiate uh, sample rates above, you know, you, you do your Nyquist math and you figure, well, what's the highest hertz you can actually hear based on the hairs that are left in your decaying basilar membrane in your ears, and, you know, you, you come up with a number that's well below 48K that 96K uh, can deliver to you. So there's a practical advantage on one hand because if you've got 96K music and then you start doing stuff to it, you, know, you distort it or you're just scaling it, you know, you're, you're volume scaling it, that introduces distortion, and mm. if you have extra bits, that is security against that distortion. So there is some technical advantage, and there's also a psychological advantage, I would argue, on one hand. Uh, I'm going to argue against my own point, but I'll first make this point and say that there's a psychological advantage in portraying audio quality as something to be cherished, something to be thought of as, as high-end and important part of the game, so if you argue for 96K, the argument may go, well, you're establishing kind of a, you're portraying audio as, as something valuable, and you're maybe starting a precedent of respecting it. And maybe down the line, that means they won't bash it down to 16-bit. To maybe they'll say, okay, well, you know, we'll take it down to 44.1 and 24-bit. And, and but if you started at 96, it's like, it's like bidding really high and if you're, if you're <laughs> ordering someone. Yeah. But... All that said, uh, I would probably try to earn the respect of the developers by respecting their limited resources and the footprint of the uh, game deliverable and say, look, there's some marginal advantage, but let's put your processing, your CPU cycle somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's, you know, because if, if they know that I'm not just hogging every advantage I can for music, they'll know that I'm a team player, and, and I think I will be. Uh, yeah. I, would, I would defend 24 bits, for sure, if that were even on the table. I go up to the bat for that, uh, and you'd have to, you know, if it went down to mono, uh, there would be screening and throwing of objects, at least at the Skype screen. You know, I, would, I would definitely fight before uh, crossing the Mason-Dixon line of stereo mono, but when it comes to those super high rates, uh, I feel like that's an indulgence. You know, I gotta laugh, Mike. A, very funny anecdotes, but secondly, uh, your, your stream has gone from high def to a little bit of a grainy mic to a super grainy mic to just a damn picture. <laughs> so appropriate. It's like as Mike talks more, the the you or Google just keeps stripping him of quality as he's talking about quality. <laughs> you don't care about quality, huh? Well, let's see what happens when we take it away. Yeah, now what? <laughs> so, uh, uh, Matt M in the chat room made a very good point. He said, um, "Wouldn't multi-channel wouldn't multi-channel audio be more important than HD sample rates for creating realism and immersion?" Multi-channel audio is so great. It's it's still amazing how many people don't have it. Um, <laughs> you, you have these 60-inch, 70-inch flat-screen TVs. With the speakers being used on the television. Right, the speakers on, or, or, no, they splurged. They got a sound bar. Yeah. No way. Yeah. Holy cow. Not oh, even by The phone. sound bar has a subwoofer attached, too. Forget so about it. I can retire. 2.1. So, and even if they do have a surround sound system, you know, where are those rear speakers going to be? Where's the center channel? Oh, yeah. the center channel is behind the TV. The center channel is on the floor. And so that creates all these weird things. Or, uh, Their TV glows, but they've got two speakers. <laughs> you know, uh, well, Multi-channel. Glowing LEDs rather than on a 5.1 system. Uh, a properly calibrated, properly set up 5.1 system is great. Yeah. Um, you know, there's some old theaters that still have just 5.1, and you watch it move film there, it's 5.1, and it's good. The soundtrack sounds great in 5.1. <laughs> For consumer standards, we're already to the point where we've got uh, things like... Um, you know, Dolby Digital in 7.1, DTS in 6.1 and 7.1, but it doesn't help if 
you know, their speakers are not in the right place, and so uh, something panning behind you doesn't sound like it's actually wishing past your head. It sounds like something totally weird. Um, oh, it's multi-channel is so great, and it can be so immersive, but it, it annoys me so much. I have a... I have a bit of a diatribe, like two minutes, but I don't want to steal the thunder from the other guys talking about my multi-channel. So if you guys uh, had some ad additions, I was just going to speak, and I'm not going to do it right now. I'll let you guys go first about an experience I just had this week about multi-channel and how important it is. But uh, you guys first. Do it, Kyle. So are you sure, Mike? Do you got anything to add on multi-channel? Can uh, Mike no, hear us? No. I might have said it's already been covered. So, um... So I was doing a multi-channel mix, and I had a hard drive die while I was doing this mix, and I replaced the hard drive. And in replacing the hard drive, even though it's a Drobo and it's a, it's a, 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 a well, I can't think of the term right now, a striped backup system, oh. uh, it was rebuilding the hard drive. But I, I noticed that it messed up my software, so I reinstalled some software. That software that I was using for 5.1 placement set it to film. And I want to explain to you what the difference between ITU or SMPT, which is the yeah. standard for 5.1, and film is. I delivered the mix to the client, and they said, you've got distortion everywhere, and almost everything's in the center speaker. Do you mind redoing a remix? And I said, no, but i got to figure out what the hell happened. What happened is I replaced the hard drive, had to reinstall some software. It set itself to the film standard. Film's standard is left. Right, uh, left, center, if I'm doing this right, because there's a bunch of different ones. Left, center, right, LS, RS, LFE. ITU is left, right, center, LFE, LS, RS. Uh, and as you, can as you can imagine, I encoded thinking that I was encoding for ITU. The software changed the encoding, but was still putting everything in the proper speakers. So even though my center channel at my studio was coming out the center channel. When it encoded, it put it on the right channel. And the stuff that was in the LS and the RS put it also in the center, even though in my studio I heard it out of the LS and the RS. And then, of course, because everything was getting multiplied on these speakers, it was distorting like crazy. And let me tell you something. If you ever do 5-1 mixing, LUFS is your friend. Look up LUFS and stick to the standard. It sounds quiet in your studio when you're doing a mix. Turn up your volume knob, but then go play it on your 5.1 system in your front room, and you'll find that you match what everybody else is doing. That's a very important standard to live by is the LUFS standard. But you have to be cognizant of your encoding because if, you, if it switches on you, your system, given my system, the way it's set up, will automatically adjust and make you think everything is in its right place. But then when you send it to the client... Your film setup, your film encoding, plays on their ITU, and everything is completely different. It was frightening for me because, you know, your reputation's online. You're saying, here's a mix. I love it. I think it sounds great. And they, they on their end, they hear it out of three speakers, and it's completely distorted. And they go, does this guy even know what he's talking about? you got to be very careful in those cases. And I do want to say one more thing about Luffs is that when you hear a show, and then a commercial comes on, here's a show, Here's its volume, and then a commercial comes on. Here's its volume, and then a commercial goes away, and the show happens again. It's because the commercials are ignoring LUFs. They're just they're plastering the sound. They're not staying in this negative 23 uh, target for the LUFs standard, so that everybody sounds nice and even across all these different speaker systems. And and these uh, uh, anyway, I, I'm I'm rambling at this point, but I just wanted you guys to know how important that is when you're doing 5.1. And with that said, is 5.1 more important than high def? At this state of the business, given that we work in the, 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 the job of putting audio to picture, absolutely. I think multi-channel is absolutely more important than, than high def. I think we're a long way away from having a high def standard, but we are right now already having a multi-channel standard. And the more that we can evangelize that and get that to happen, I think it's a good thing. Hope I imparted some knowledge there about my experience this week with this extremely embarrassing mix. <laughs> Whew. Yeah. It's, it's cool. You know, um, the left standard, that's actually a relatively recent thing. Um, and I actually had just uh, gotten some new monitoring in order to actually accommodate that because, you know, for years, 
it's just been the usual stuff. You know, I got my SoundForge, and it's still it does it's the old SoundForge, so everything is still DBFS. And actually, you can sort you know ninety nine percent of the time DBFS does translate over to to LUFS, but it's not exactly the same thing. There's some really interesting papers that have come out in the last years on the whys and hows of incorporating and thinking in terms of loudness units and how you definitely need to do that if you're going to be doing anything for TV and film. Although the game world is still a crazy world where you want to go as loud as possible on the iPad so that everyone in the restaurant can hear what game you're playing, right? The marketing of audio is embarrassing sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I will tell you, though, that if you want a fantastic piece of gear and we do like to impart this kind of knowledge, and I don't know if you guys have used this. Um, there's a piece of gear by Isotope called Insight. It's costly. It's worth every penny. I hope they... I want to really get Isotope to represent us, uh, to sponsor us, excuse me, and perhaps I can talk them away, uh, talk them into giving away a copy of Insight. Um, it's expensive. I think it's 500 bucks. But my God, it has been... It has just been invaluable to me in the past year or whatever it's been out. I don't even know if it's that long. Uh, at least that's how long I've known about it. So definitely check out uh, Isotope's Insight, and uh, you will be very happy. I'm just waiting for um, uh, loudness metering in Lufts. The, the plugins are out there, but they're all very. It's quite a premium market at the moment. I'm waiting for it them is. to come down in price a little bit because uh, there, there are. Um, I think uh, Melda, Melda plugins do a free one actually. Ooh. Uh, a free loudness that uh, measures in LUFS. It's um because uh, Melda uh, do wonderful things with their freeware. They have incredible range of uh, free tools. Mm -hmm. um, you know they, they look a bit funny, I think. But you know if you don't care about what they look like and uh, nope. you just care about the price and the uh, and um, the functionality, Melda does And I think they have one of the things, Melda M loudness meter or something. I think which mm -hmm. has um, measures in LUFS. It's pretty primitive. It's not like some of the like you know TC Electronics or the the, um, the other loudness meters out there, but yeah, I'm just sort of waiting for that technology to become a bit more um, affordable. Right now, it's sort of because it's so new, all the plugin makers are jumping on it with quite premium price ranges. So, good point. Good point. Uh, if you want, though, yeah. uh, if this is any help, Cubase has it built in. Mm -hmm. I was pretty impressed with that. But then again, I did a comparison of the Cubase to Isotope. I had it setting on the master, I Insight on the master on. Cubase, and then I was comparing it to what Cubase was telling me, and there was about a 5 dB difference between the two of them. So I went with the one that had the lowest registry, so that uh, register, registry, what do you say? Mike's smart like that. He'll correct me. Um, the lowest uh, denominator, and so that way I knew I wasn't going to break the rules if I went a little high. Because, you know, negative 23 is what you want to shoot for with LUFS, but my last mix was negative 20.9. You're going to, it's going to edge out a little bit. I think um, uh, if you have uh, Adobe's Creative Cloud, then um, Adobe Audition also has, uh, I think it's TC Electronics Loudness Radar, which is a plugin which uh, it comes bundled with. So uh, if you're using Creative Cloud, then yeah, check out Adobe Audition. That has loudness metering too. Yeah, and TC Electronics does fantastic stuff. Mm. Although mm. I like their hardware better than software. I like all hardware better than software because I'm an old man. I'm an old grumpy <laughs> man. I bet you like your CS80s too, Kyle. Do you want me to show you that picture again? I want to see the picture again because we have to wrap up, and nothing wraps up like a fantastic picture of Jeff Bridges. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, I mean, if if you're gonna, if you ask nicely like that, I mean. Uh, While you bring up that picture, you know, I was looking on Melda Productions website, and they yeah. do have a nice free bundle with a lot of good stuff. And I remember actually. Uh, messing around with some of these things, and one of the things they do have is a pretty good loudness analyzer, it seems. So yeah, that's, that's yeah, definitely just check out that Melda free bundle. Yeah, they have a lot of great free tools. Uh, one of them being a loudness meter. You know, now that I look at it, I can see the Photoshop. But you see, who cares? I mean, it, it, even for this Photoshop, <laughs> yeah, the, the fact that somebody would think, oh, I know, let's put let's put Jeff Bridges' head on somebody playing a CS80. I mean, that's brilliant. It's brilliant. It is. It's beautiful. But you can see how they cut out around the hair and how his face is a better definition than the curtains. 
Funny how it's I Jeff that. Bridges. He always has better definition than anything else. <laughs> so, so I say for our next show, we just have a, uh, a a movie night and we just watch The Big Lebowski, which I, I'm one of the billions of people who think that's a fantastic movie, but I love that movie. <laughs> oh, man. But, but perhaps just, we would be out of our element if we did that. See what I did. Just, let's just get Jeff Bridges on. I'll Which call I, him. All right. I'm on the phone. I'm writing it down right now. Jeff Bridges. He lives in Santa Barbara. It can't be too hard, right? It's right down the road. I can just knock on his door. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Kyle. How are you going? Yeah. Remember me? Uh, I donate to the Santa Barbara uh, Bowl just like you do, so we must be related. <laughs> he actually can sense it when you mention his name, kind of like Cthulhu, so I think if you say his name three times, he'll be aware of our need. Jeff Bridges, Jeff Bridges, Jeff Bridges. Do we have to be looking at a mirror when we do that? Uh, yeah. All right. It's, it. it's deteriorated into a pumpkin head. Uh, it's going to deteriorate into pumpkin head, and I cannot allow that. So uh, with that, I'm going to say bye. And thanks, Chatties, for finding the chat room. I will fix that this week. Sorry for the technical issues. Chase, thank you so much for your demo. I hope we were helpful. Uh, it's in, I, I, I just get uncomfortable doing it, but I hope I imparted some sort of information. All in all, I really like the song, and it's in my uh, iTunes, so thank you for the free song. Yeah. All right, guys. I'm saying bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye, everybody.